Let's try not to let the smoke out of anything today. Stick around and we'll get right to it. Real quick before we get going today, I've got to give a shout out to these guys. They're my latest patrons over on Patreon. If you'd like to help support the channel, I'll leave a link to Patreon down in the description below. We spend quite a bit of time in the RV traveling throughout the year. And one of the things that I'm always concerned with is losing power at the house. I just, uh, I, I want to be made aware of that in the event that that does happen. So I started thinking about how I might could utilize uh, my radio systems here at home to alert me to when we lost commercial power. Now, let me say right up front, this is not a how-to tutorial. In fact, if you do any of this, you're doing it at your own risk. I am not an electrical engineer. In fact, I don't even have a background in electronics. And that's why you saw the thumbnail on this video that you did. So, word of caution right up front, proceed at your own risk. I just want to show you what I did. This was a huge learning experience for me. I had no clue how I was going to monitor commercial power with the Raspberry Pi when I started this. I spent probably three days researching on and off various components of this project. I would go a little ways or get into it a little ways, have a failure and have to back up and figure it out again. So I want to jump over to the workbench, show you guys how I wired this up so that my Raspberry Pi DigiPeter could monitor the commercial power here at the house. Now keep in mind, my radio system, if we lose power, will run on batteries. So I believe there's two radios and two or three Raspberry Pis that are all maintained by that 35 amp hour uh, Miati battery. Also, I'll leave links to some of the components that I used for this video down in the description below if you are interested and willing to step out and learn a little bit yourself. So the first thing I did was scrounge around in one of my junk boxes and found this old wall wart. This is one that'll plug into a household outlet and give you a single USB uh, A type plug on the other end of it. You'll notice that this one puts out five volts at one amp. So I knew that would be a good starting point for the project. In that same box, I found a USB cord. I cut the micro USB end off of it stripped the cable back and it left me, or the outer jacket back, and it left me with four wires. So I plugged this up to the wall board, grabbed my multimeter, and started checking. And if I went between the red and black wires, I got roughly five volts. But I did go ahead and check between the other wires as well. I knew that the limit on the Raspberry Pi was 3.3 volts of input, so I didn't want to exceed that. But what I found was if I went between the red wire and the white wire, I ended up getting roughly 2.3 volts. So I decided to use those two wires. Now, the next thing I wanted to do was I didn't want to feed too much amperage into this. So I grabbed a uh, calculator on my phone. This is an Ohm's Law calculator. I put in that 2.3 volts and then I used a resistor of 2K right here to see what the amperage would give me. And that come out to 1.15 milliamps. And I assumed that that would be okay feeding into the Pi. That's not very much voltage at all. Fortunately, I did go and look up some data on the Raspberry Pi itself. And lo and behold, I come to find out that the maximum input amperage was only 0.5 milliamps. So I had to go back to the calculator. Thank goodness I looked at this before I plugged anything up. Going back to the calculator, I plugged in a 10K ohm resistor this time, and I'm coming up uh, with 230 microamps of power. So we should be safe at this point to plug that into the Pi. Grabbing the soldering iron, this isn't the prettiest soldering job you'll see online, but uh, you don't come to this channel for soldering lessons. I did go ahead and put that 10K ohm resistor 
in line on the positive lead. After everything was soldered together and covered with some heat shrink, I did go ahead and plug that into the Raspberry Pi. And I used the BCM23 port to plug in the positive lead and the ground just above it to plug in the ground side. At this point, I went ahead and started working on the script, and we'll get to the script here in just a minute. I got the script to working. The only problem was is I was running into a lot of false alerts. So it was telling me that I didn't have power when I knew for a fact that everything was plugged up and working. It would run through maybe 10 or 15 cycles and then trigger another false alarm. So I went back to the drawing board and after a bit more research, it turns out that those wall boards do not give you a clean DC signal out. They have a lot of uh, ups and downs in their voltage and I needed to smooth that out before I was going to be able to make this work. So I figured out that I was going to need a capacitor. Biggest challenge for me, not being uh, an electrical person or not having an electronics background, I wasn't really sure of what size capacitor I need. I did know that the voltage uh, needed to support that uh, voltage that I was going to put into it, which is only 2.3 volts. I chose a 25 volt, 100 microfarad capacitor. This time, instead of soldering everything together, I did just go ahead and breadboard this just to verify that everything was going to work and I wasn't going to run into some sort of other issue uh, like I had done the first time around. Now, though, when I plugged this up and ran the script that uh, I had been working on, everything worked like it should. I let it run for a couple of hours in the shack just to make sure that we weren't going to get any false alerts. Once I knew that the false alerts were not going to occur, I did go ahead and go back and solder everything together. Again, not the prettiest job, but uh, I'm not a cable maker, so you guys give me some slack here. Even though it doesn't look the greatest, it does work perfect, so I'll take that. So this project took me quite a while because I spent a truckload of time researching. You don't know what you don't know, and I made a few mistakes along the way. I'm not a hardware guy. I play with software all the time, but when it comes to building cables, I'm usually out. Uh, somebody just send me a link so I can purchase the thing. But now that I had the hardware side figured out, it was time to focus in on the code. And let's take a look at that and I'll show you guys exactly what I came up with. Now this code is available over on my GitHub. That's github.com forward slash km4ack. It's in the PyScripts repository and the script name is Electric Detect. It is written in Python, though I am not uh, proficient in Python by any stretch of the imagination. I know just enough to get myself in trouble usually. Uh, but we do have the shebang line right up at the top telling you that this is written in Python 3. We import a few things that we're going to use inside the script. And then we start setting up the GPIO pins. So I'm setting the mode to BCM. There's two different ways you can uh, call these boards, either by board or by BCM numbering. Uh, I chose to use the BCM numbering. The next thing we do is we set up uh, BCM23 to be an input, and I'm using the pull-down resistor here. I'm not sure if I really need to be using this resistor here or not, but it's working as it is. There's no harm in using, so I'm going to go ahead and use it. I do set a couple of variables right here. X equals 1 and hours equals 0. And we'll kind of show you where those come into play here in just a second. The script will pause for 10 seconds uh, right at the very beginning. I'm running this at boot, and I just wanted to give it a little bit more time to make sure everything else that needed to be up and running was before this script starts. Now we're going to move into the main function of the script, and that is everything you see right there. So the first thing I do now, a lot of this script is dumping information out to the terminal. I've taken a lot of this out in my actual working script, but I left it here. So if you want to play with this code, uh, it'll give you some output on the screen without actually doing much else. So what I did was as soon as the function starts, it clears the screen. 
and it imports that uh, x variable as a global variable. So that gives us x equals 1 inside this function. Now, the next thing we do is we say while true. So basically, we're going to run this in a loop indefinitely. Uh, I didn't want it to stop. I wanted this to continue because I want it to be monitoring at all times. Inside that while loop, we are running this command right here, if gpio.input23. All that says is, is if we have voltage on pin 23, I want you to do something. In this case, we're simply printing out we have electric. So we will put that information on the screen and then it increments the X variable. At one point in time when I was working on this script, I did uh, have this putting a number out beside it just so it didn't look like one thing on the screen, but it would say we have electric one, two, three, four, and you could actually see it progressing. And then we've got it sleeping for 60 seconds. Uh, we don't really need this thing to check on a super regular basis, but checking uh, once a minute should be sufficient. You could always increase this. If you, put, uh, if you change this to 600 instead of 60, it would check for power every 10 minutes instead of every 60 seconds. So as long as we have voltage, this is all it's going to do. It's going to print this on the screen, wait 60 seconds, and print this on the screen again. Now, when we lose voltage, that's where our else statement comes in. When voltage uh, is removed, then we start another while true loop because I want it to run this uh, loop indefinitely as long as we don't have voltage. Now, you'll notice this statement is a little bit different from the previous one that you saw right up here. In this case, it says, if not, gpio.input23. And that means if we don't have voltage on that pin, then I want you to do a new set of commands. Again, we're pulling in a global variable. This time, it's ours. And I'm setting the message that we want to send eventually. Uh, right now, this is electric lost at home. Then we're adding how many hours and finishing the message with hours ago. This right here is a variable that was set right up here at the top. So hours equals zero. So the first time you get one of these message, uh, messages delivered to you, it would just say uh, electric lost at home zero hours ago. That way you know that it just occurred. And I am printing that message to the screen right here, and then we increment that hours variable by one. So the next time this message goes out, it would say electric lost at home one hour ago. Now, the next line right here is commented out. This is where I am calling a bash script that actually sends out an APRS message over RF. Remember, I've lost power, so I don't have internet at home, but the radios are on backup, and they will stay up and running at least for a period of time. So I am calling another script right here, but this is commented out so that it will not try to call that script uh, if you take this code and play with it. So the way it is right now, after it prints this message on the screen and it increments the hours variable, it will also print on the screen sleeping for one hour. And it's, that's where you see this time.sleep command with 3600 seconds in it. So it's going to wait for an hour before it goes back and checks this pin right here again to see if it has voltage or not. If there's no voltage again, you're going to get a new message with the incremented hours variable right here. If after this sleep command here that waits an hour, there is voltage, then it's going to uh, print out electric restored send message. Uh, in my case, I have it calling that subprocess again, where it's calling this bash script, this APRS hyphen RF hyphen message bash script, and it is sending a power restored message uh, out over RF. It sleeps for 10 seconds and then it resends that same message again. Now, the reason I do it twice is just in case there's a packet collision in the first one. Uh, I'm sending it out the second time. If both messages go out within 10 seconds, it's just going to look like a duplicate on the, uh, on the APRS 
system, and I don't believe I will get two messages there. Uh, so I should just get one delivered, but basically this is just in case um, I have a packet collision in the system. It sleeps for 10 seconds after it has sent that message the second time, and then we're simply returning to the top of the my function function. So that's an overview of how the Python script works. Now let's go take a quick look at the APRS script. Now we're not going to walk through every single piece of this script, but I do want to show you some of the important parts uh, that you're going to need if you try to use this one. Again, this is in my PyScripts repository, and this one is called APRS-RF-MSG. This does assume that you have KissUtil and Direwolf already installed. Now, mine is running on my Digipeter itself, so I don't have to worry about uh, sending anything across the network, but this will work across the network if you've got Direwolf set up uh, correctly. But setting up Direwolf and KissUtil is beyond the scope of this particular video. If you do use this script, you will need to put your call sign right here where it says no call. And you need to set the IP address of the computer running Direwolf. If it's running on the local system that this script is also running on, then you can use the 127.0.0.1 IP address. The to call is email-2, and all that is going to do is use the email-2 server to take an APRS message and deliver it to your inbox. You do need to update your email address right here that you want um, the message delivered to. Don't modify this little part right here where we've got the dollar sign, curly braces uh, with the one inside of it. That is needed and is provided to this script. Uh, it's simply a variable and it's provided to this script from the Python script. Other than that, you should not need to modify anything on this at all. Uh, anything below this particular line right here uh, where it says MSG. The only exception I can think of is if your KissUtil is not installed in user local bin, you might need to update uh, that path before this would work correctly. So here's a look at one of the emails that was delivered to me once power was lost. You can see right up here at the top, it tells me electric was lost at home zero hours ago. It repeats that down here in the body of the message as well. Once power was restored after it had waited like that hour-long period, I did get a message that told me power had been restored. Again, that's coming in to my primary email address. If you're an electronics expert or the engineering type, leave it down in the comments below what I messed up. But I didn't let the smoke out of anything, so I'll take that as a win. I hope you found today's information useful, or at least entertaining. Be sure to give us a thumbs up before you head off. We will see you guys on the next one. Until then, 7-3.